architect Divya Chakravarti. She completed her undergraduate studies from SRM University and she went on to pursue her masters in historic preservation and urbanism and study of the built environment from the University of California, Los Angeles. She went on to work for the Department of Planning and Preservation for the city of Pasadena, California. She also did a brief stint of work for Historic Scotland, Edinburgh, UK. She also worked on conservation projects like Kalsa Mahal, Gokhale Hall in Chennai and Marimala Park Educational Trust in Mysore. She is currently working as the director of Samrakshan Heritage Consultancy. She is also a co-founder of the Artisan Reprisal of Traditional Materials. method and technology she goes on to conduct workshops to revive traditional and lost methods of construction welcome to the ugc lecture series for bachelors of architecture the subject we are discussing is environmental science and the topic we'll be delving into is environment ecosystems and biodiversity in this lecture we'll be looking into biodiversity the threats to biodiversity to begin with what recent issues have developed on biodiversity like about 75% of the genetic diversity of crop plants have been lost just in the past century some scientists estimate that as many as 3 species per hour are going extinct and 20000 extinctions occur each year these species could be across the ecosystem not necessarily only in plant life or animal life it could be insects or anything Roughly one third of the world's coral reef systems have been destroyed or highly degraded. About twenty-four percent of mammals and twelve percent of bird species are currently considered to be globally threatened. More than fifty percent of the world's wetlands have drained, and populations of inland water and wetland species have declined by about fifty percent between just nineteen seventy and nineteen ninety-nine. If you look at the biodiversity in India, if you look at the mammals, we have in India alone about 386 different species. So percentage of Indian species evaluated is 59 and threatened percentage is a massive 41%. Again, if you look at reptiles, the number of Indian species we have is 495, but the threatened species alone is a whopping 46%. And if you move to freshwater fish, We have around 700 species in the Indian origin, out of which 70% is threatened. So you can see what a large percentage is threatened in just in the context of one country, that is India. If this was to be taken, every country did a survey like this. You would realize that the number of species that are at the speed we are discovering, at the same speed we are even losing certain species and subspecies. certain biodiversity conventions the first convention of biodiversity was organized at rio de janeiro which is the capital of brazil from in 1992 and this was obviously led by the united nations it was the united nation conference on environment and development it was otherwise also referred to as the rio summit to maintain ecological balance enrich biodiversity The agreement on biodiversity was signed initially by 150 countries and the three programs that were inclusive are to ensure conservation of biodiversity sustainable use of biodiversity rational and equitable share of profit to acquire from use of genetic resources second convention was in johannesburg in 2002 so nearly a decade later this was the world summit on sustainable development where biodiversity and sustainable ecosystem management was the core issue so in spite of having a decade span in between the two conventions the topics have pretty much remained the same when we want to talk of environment and development and later we have seen that in spite of any number of laws and things that were taken about in around 92 the changes that were developed that had changed in terms of biodiversity conservation laws or let it be the rapid progress of extinction or endangered species nothing much had changed now the whole shift of the parable was towards sustainable ecosystem management the international conference was held on biodiversity in relation to food 
and human security in a warming planet that was in 2010 very much in our own city. Then you had the International Conference on Wildlife and Biodiversity which was held in 2010 at Kashmir and then another in Tirmanamthapuram in Kerala. So in spite of having so many conventions, all the focus has been on, we are obviously going to be dependent on biodiversity. Having a life without biodiversity is impossible. At the same time, how do we take from biodiversity at the same time, not detracting its value? Let's give back at the same speed we are taking or at a relatively better speed we are taking. So 2010 with respect to India was a very active year where there were constant dialogues and discussions with at a global level to how to go about preserving biodiversity and realizing the importance of biodiversity and the importance of it not only in the lifespan of a human being but also the interrelationships and correlationships that man has with many other species in the planet. Biodiversity is our life. If biodiversity got lost at the rate it is getting lost now, the very survival of human beings will be threatened. So it is very much our moral duty to conserve biodiversity as well as our environment. Long term maintenance of species, their management requires cooperative efforts across entire landscapes. Biodiversity should be dealt with at scale of habitats or ecosystems rather than at a species level. So that is the main problem. We look, we end up concentrating on all the small details that we lose the big picture. The purpose of the big picture is entire encompassing biodiversity across the globe. In spite of us being small minded about other reasons, politi political reasons, other issues, when it comes to biodiversity, this is one issue where globally we should take a stand because it is only if we look at entire landscapes that we can decide how we can conserve biodiversity. If we take species by species, it's not going to be possible because there is a correlationship as well as interdependency between species, between different levels of the food chain as well as traffic levels within the food web. So all of these have to be taken into consideration when we look into biodiversity. The different threats to biodiversity, you have like we saw, you have genetic diversity where each member of an animal or plant species differs widely from other individuals in its genetic makeup. Then you have species diversity where the number of species of plants and animals that are present in one particular region constitutes its species diversity. Then you have the ecosystem diversity there are a variety of different ecosystems on earth, each having their own complement of distinctive interlinked species based on the differences in that habitat. So if you look at different threats to biodiversity, you have habitat destruction, where it's very important to protect habitat in order to protect the animals or biodiversity within it. Well, biodiversity encompasses a number of species. It covers plant life, insect life, microbial life, everything it covers, anything which has a living organic cell comes under the umbrella of biodiversity. So there's a huge pressure from the world, rapidly increasing population because we have seen and previous, previously that how important biodiversity is to us, how many of our needs are dependent on biodiversity. Then the next important threat is global climatic change. So there is an immense change in biotic elements of the ecosystem like global warming and things like that which is causing a huge biotic change. Habitat fragmentation. This is mainly from human activity because we go about cutting forests for our purposes let it be agricultural purpose or industrial purpose or construction purpose whatever the purpose as and when man is getting rid of forest we are getting rid of huge chunk of that biodiversity that particular area supports. So it basically reduces the ability of habitat to support certain species. In, next important uh, threat is pollution. Introduction of pollutants such as nutrient overloading with nitrate fertilizers as well as more immediately which can be felt harmful chemicals 
which enter the food chain and hence the different levels of the food web as well over exploitation this includes the illegal wildlife trade as well as overfishing logging of tropical hardwoods etc alien species this is introduced by humans to regions where there are no natural predators like even a recent article that came about was one particular forest they have realized because of the poaching of tigers and leopards there has been an increase in the number of species of the deers and antlers which is causing a imbalance in the food chain because of this they had to bring in species from another area predators to reduce the number of these deers diseases reduction in habitat causing high population densities encourages the spread of diseases so when you look at the natural causes you have narrow geographical area low population low breeding rate natural disasters so even though these are considered natural causes there is certain amount of a human element in all of this that we influence certain natural disasters like landslides or even an earthquake could be considered a natural disaster but because of soil erosion and deforestation and improper drilling and all of those issues causes these natural disasters so even though natural disaster by itself cannot be categorized as anthropogenic that is human causes there is a intrinsic element where uh, humans are involved in these factors then you have anthropogenic causes which is habitat modification over exploitation of selected species innovation by exotic species so this happens when especially with respect to crops and plants when yield is a major factor to feed our ever increasing population what happens is man they does a lot of research trying to introduce genetically modified crops crops that will grow faster crops that will har can be harvested faster crops that are more le less prone to diseases and more resistant to certain bacteria or fungi so all of these modified species also are threat to biodiversity because it actually hampers the naturally occurring species habitat loss you can see clearly how forests are getting completely cleared in that too as and when technology is improving the rate at which trees are felled is nothing compared to the rate at which trees are grown or planted previously when it was completely dependent on man made labor and completely human labor it used to be a slow tedious process to just get one tree few men would be required to just do that one job but now with technological development trees can be felled by the minute by the hour and forest can be cleared in a couple of days so at the rate of this no way it can plants be replanted or expected to be grown at that period of time habitat loss can be described when an animal loses their home every animal in the animal kingdom has one particular niche a particular place that they call their environment in the animal community so without this habitat they no longer have that particular niche or home so major reasons of loss is agriculture farming because of a ever increasing population and the need to feed it we have to keep increasing the percentage of agricultural land harvesting natural resources for personal use for industrial and urbanization development so habitat destruction is currently ranked as the primary cause of species extinction worldwide so if you look at an impact, uh, example we look into the panda which is the national animal of china you find it across the country but now it is found only in fragmented and isolated regions in southwest of the country as a result of widespread deforestation in the 20th century but there are certain natural causes attached to it too such as volcanism fire and climatic change in where is well documented in the fossil record one study shows that fragmentation of tropical rainforest in europe is about 3000 million years ago led to a great loss of amphibian diversity so you can actually see certain natural causes are meant to happen because that species was supposed to get extinct but when it comes under the control of man and man influenced activities we obviously have to step in 
if it is completely by natural causes maybe it is nature's way of saying that species has to face its end like how we have lost dinosaurs and some other species in the past but now when it is solely because of the carelessness of humans and mankind a step has to be taken to see what needs to be done these are forest fires that are typically seen then you have the volcanic eruptions you have floods all of these are natural calamities but again forest fires in some cases are induced by man because he wants to remove that entire forest cover for some particular personal use so this is done by land mafias across the world or even wood mafias who are involved in the wooden trade so what solutions are there for just this problem protecting remaining intact section of the natural habitat we need to not only trace the different species across the world but also find out the endemic species particular to that particular area so that we can go about protecting their natural habitat when we think of just the species we might think we can take it to a conservatory uh, conservatory lab you can take it to a natural forest all of these wildlife sanctuaries all of that is secondary first we'll have to make an attempt to protect the natural habitat reduce human population and expansion of urbanization and industries educating the public about the importance of natural habitat and biodiversity solutions to habitat loss can include planting trees planting home gardens so as to reduce the need of man for large lands for agricultural farms which then lead to habitat loss the next important crucial thing that reduces biodiversity is poaching poaching could be for number of reasons it's actually basically illegal hunting and harvesting taking of wild plants or animals through let it could even be through traps fishing harvesting hunting all of this that is even fish is included trapping of certain mammals and other reptiles for their different products so all of this is encompasses poaching so if you look at history of poaching the term poaching even though means illegal initially if you look at the stone ages and very much in history man has always tried to tame the animal and think that animal is for his own use so that has been true not only to the stone ages but even till date to in certain tribal communities but even tribal communities do it with a lot of care making sure that the food chain is not affected they do not over exhaust one particular species it was only during to the late middle ages that poaching actually became a punishable offense because man by then had become, was considered civilized and he had other methods of feeding himself and other methods of clothing himself it was when it was started to being done for game for the purpose of just fun it became a punishable offense it's done for tigers and all these rhinoceros the deers all of them are hunted for their tusks for their skin for their horns all of these animals and for their animal products and all of these don't have only med not just medicinal purpose or something high end it is just vanity products like handbags it could be decorative pieces it could be small items like or household items so all of these have no valid purpose as such they other materials are there to substitute their natural products but still the poaching environment is a multi billion dollar industry because the entire fashion industry developing is de is developing based on the plain sourcing of poaching all across the globe so it's done for large profits gained by either animal parts meats and pelts so it exists because there's a demand for these products and there is still a demand because there's a lack of education or plain disregard for law amongst different buyers they know nothing can be done it cannot be traced back to them so there is a basic disregard and careless attitude towards this many cultures believe that certain animal parts have medicinal value but that percentage is very small the rest of it is basically only for commercial purposes it's not only limited to animals but also plants these plants are three of the most poached species galax black cohosh and ginseng 
because they are used right in beverage industry like teas it is used in medicine industries as a regenerating drug a lot of these plants have huge medicinal properties which are manufactured across the globe how does poaching actually affect the environment illegal hunting causes animals getting endangered and then becoming extinct if more animals become extinct then there's definitely a disruption in the food chain and that will cause major problems in our ecosystem resulting eventually in new adaptations of animals or species beyond human control poaching results in animals being hunted too soon for them to have time to reproduce and repopulate man wild conflicts this encompasses the different conflicts mankind has with the wildlife if you think about the man animal conflict this is the major problem associated with conservation of wild animals especially the herbivores like elephants in india because they cause severe damage to crops and even manslaughter animals such as elephants gaur samba wild boar and birds like peacock cause extensive damage to crops this phenomenon has registered significant increase in recent years due to habitat fragmentation and degradation of natural forests and corridors instances of many man made man animal conflicts keep on coming to limelight from different states in the country in uh, just few years back since the past few years in sambalpur and orissa about 200 human beings have been killed by elephants then again in retaliation the villagers went and killed about 100 elephants and they badly injured 30 so such kinds of conflicts not only happens only in this state but across different states let it be kerala tamil nadu because we actually use these animals for our purposes but then when we end up going on their land let it be forest or any other things they do tend to come for food because that is their habitat they don't realize that we have taken over that habitat so several instances of killing of elephants in the border regions of kote chamrajnagar belt and mysore have also been reported quite recently you have typical examples the most felt about is an elephant because they destroy crops by the acres they come in herds they cause stampedes and they even hurt a lot of human beings so how do you go about reducing these conflicts the aim of conflict resolution or management is to reduce the potential for human wildlife conflicts in order to protect life and limb so it's basically important that the habitat is protected animal population is protected general biodiversity should also be protected at the same time any damage that is caused to the property should be minimal the preference is obviously for passive non intrusive preventive measures but often active inter- intervention is also required to be carried out management techniques of wildlife you have two types the traditional techniques which aim to stop reduce or minimize conflict by controlling animal populations lethal control has been used in history for the longest time but it has severe drawbacks other measures less costly in terms of life are translocation regulation and preservation of animal populations modern methods depend upon the understanding of ecological and ethological understanding of wildlife its environment to prevent or minimize this conflict so examples being behavioral modification and measures to reduce interaction between humans and wildlife potential solutions to these conflicts include electric fencing land use planning community based natural resource management compensation payment for environmental services ecotourism wildlife friendly products or other such field solutions so an effort to reduce human wildlife conflict the world wide fund for nature has partnered with a number of organizations to provide solutions across the globe their solutions are tailored to that community and that species involved For example in Mozambique community started to grow more chili pepper plants after making the discovery that elephants disliked and avoided plants containing capsaicin 
This creative and effective method prevents elephants from trampling community farmers fields as well as protecting the species. Now moving on to the importance of biodiversity. Generation of soil and maintenance of soil quality, maintenance of air quality, maintenance of water quality, pest control, detoxification and decomposition of waste, pollination and crop production, climate stabilization, prevention and mitigation of natural disasters, provision of food security. Moving on to biogeographical classification of India. Biogeography is the science which deals with patterns of species distribution and the processes that result in such patterns. So the patterns of species distribution at this level can be explained through a combination of historical factors such as speciation, extinction, continental drift, glaciation that is usually associated with variations in sea level, river routes and so on and river capture that is in combination with the area and isolation of land masses and availability of different supplies of energy. So typical fundamentals in biogeography are evolution that is change in genetic composition of the population, extinction disappearance of a particular species, dispersal movement of populations away from the point of origin this is usually related to migration and the cause of migration could be both natural or man-made. Then you have range and distribution and endemic areas. India has different types of climate and topography in different parts of the country and these variations have induced enormous variability in flora and fauna. India has a very rich heritage of biological diversity it is very important to study the distribution, evolution, dispersal and environmental relationship of plants and animals in time and space. Biogeography comprising of phytogeography and zoogeography deals with these aspects of plants as well as animals. In order to gain insight about the distribution and environmental interactions of flora and fauna of a country, it has been classified into 10 biogeographic zones. Each of these zones has its own characteristic climate, soil, topography and biodiversity. So if you look at the different biogeographic zones, they are representing distinctive units of similar ecology, biome representation, community as well as species. For example, you have Himalaya, then you have the Gangetic Plains the biotic provinces, the next level of detail within these zones. So an example of this is Northwestern Himalaya, Western Himalaya. The next category is biomes. This is major ecosystem groupings found within each province and region. For example, alpine, subalpine. So these are in stepped hierarchical distinction. So within India, the classification you have in 10 zones divided into 26 provinces. The zones are Trans Himalaya with two provinces, the Himalaya with four, the Indian desert with two, the semi-arid zone with two provinces, the Western Ghats with two provinces, the Deccan Peninsula with five, the Gangetic Plain with two provinces, the coast with three provinces, northeast India with two provinces and the islands with two provinces. So we have seen the different biogeographic zones within the country and the importance of these provinces and these biogeographic zones. At the end of this lecture we have looked into biodiversity, threats to biodiversity and at the end of this lecture we should be able to answer the following questions. Discuss the balance of nature biodiversity brings. What are the different threats to biodiversity? Discuss the conflict between man and wildlife. What is the importance of biodiversity? That brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you.